<laughs> Absolutely. And because it is such an ingrained thing, it's, you know, people talk a lot about the reptilian brain and that's where our like breathing comes from. Like it's automatic responses, like ducking mm. when something is coming toward your head. Our coping mechanisms that we develop early in life are actually very much the same. We're not thinking about it. It's an automatic thing. And so it's really important because people can feel like if I was just strong enough, I'd be able to do this. What's wrong mm. with me? Why can't I do this? It's not about strength. It's not about determination. It's about <laughs> awareness and continued practice over time. Those things have to be mm. there in order for any of that to actually change. It's why even like if you think about habits, changing habits, right? Because yeah. it becomes just yeah. kind of this automatic thing, not to the same degree that a coping mechanism does, but it's just this automatic thing. And changing a habit is not easy. Changing an ingrained automatic behavior is absolutely not easy and takes a lot <laughs> for that to actually change. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. You are listening to Don't Be Afraid to Talk podcast with James. I believe if we are going to affect change, we must go back to the basic, which for me, in essence, is conversations. Talking and listening is key for growth, and I hope our stories will bring us together and we can draw inspiration from each other. Conversation will include topics such as mental and physical health, trauma and its effect, suicidal thoughts, recovery, and well-being. We will continue to raise awareness and offer a different perspective, a mindset or an idea that could inspire you to take charge of your well-being and to grow as a human being. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Asset Expert. Today I'm joined by Peggy. Peggy is joining me from Arizona. Peggy is a childhood trauma survivor. She's also a former therapist, an author and a space holder that's dedicated to helping people heal and reconnect to themselves. Hello, Peggy. How are you? Hi, I am great. And I'm so happy to be here with you. <laughs> I think I got your bio right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get going, can I just ask you to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Well, you said quite a bit there. Um, so <laughs> I am a survivor and became a therapist initially, but from the very beginning was working with trauma, childhood trauma in particular. And over the years, I kind of went and ended up going to private practice. And then in 2014, we decided to sell everything and move. So I closed my practice and we traveled a little bit and I decided to start doing my work online a little bit more. I already had a YouTube channel but I started to just kind of focus on creating more content, sharing more information. And over time, I ended up working with people individually and offering virtual groups and retreats um, and shared my own podcast. And I think that that is in part how we came to know one another. So here I am mm. with you today. <laughs> yes, yes, there's a, a lot and on your youtube channel mm -hmm. yeah there's, there's a lot there which is great there's a lot and uh, there's a lot of videos and a lot of information there so it's a good watch <laughs> thank you and i've um, had it for a long time it's been 10 years <laughs> yes yes and that is your oldest video 10 years old <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah today we're going to be talking about coping mechanism and before we get to that we're going to play a quick game called One for One, Ooh. where I give you a word and you say the first word that comes to your mind. Okay. I will do my best. I, I, I tend to stumble a little bit here because there's so many, my thoughts are like this. So I will try to. Yeah. 
just the first. One you don't have to think about it. <laughs> they just random <laughs> words. <laughs> okay. Okay. The first one is microphone. Speaking. Moment. Breathe. Pineapple. Juicy. Experiences. Exciting. <laughs> and the last one is whispers. Soul. Yeah, that's all. That's <laughs> all that is. <laughs> okay. Now uh, I'm just gonna have my drink. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my first question is, what is coping mechanism first of all before we get into some of the examples <laughs> so coping mechanisms are something that we all have and they develop pretty early on in life they can change as time goes on but for the most part our primary coping mechanisms are things that we develop very early in life we're typically mm -hmm. not taught ways of coping it's just kind of a natural thing that we develop and the coping mechanisms we end up developing are often influenced by the environment in which we are growing up in. <laughs> but from way, oh, childhood. Sorry, but from childhood. Um, and there, there are ways that we learn to kind of navigate life experiences, emotions, and feelings predominantly. So we'll, we're going to talk about some of these, so it will be a little bit more clear as we talk about them. But it's basically, how do we manage or handle something that we're experiencing or feeling? Mm. Particularly mm. that's not mm. pleasant. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. That's how they show up. And <laughs> Okay, so we start with the first one. What well, is not really in order, but... We start with the big one. I think it's a big one. Uh, denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is that and how does that show up? So uh, denial is kind of an interesting one because it can be really hard to recognize. Because if you think about denial, just the idea of denial in general, you're kind of unaware that it's there. So if you're unaware that it's there, how can you acknowledge that you're in denial about it? So it can be a really challenging mm. way of or challenging coping mechanism to identify and move away from. So denial can take on a couple of different aspects. And one can be actual denial about something that's happened or something that you're feeling. It could be conscious. No, that didn't happen. No, I don't feel that. It could be unconscious where your mind is kind of not allowing you to, to really acknowledge, to take in the reality of that feeling or experience. So it can show up in both ways. As somebody who works with people who have experienced childhood trauma, it often tends to be where it tends to be really problematic is the denial of the impact or the significance of an experience. And then the other coping mechanisms can kind of play into that too, but it's not being able to really recognize that this is what happened and this is what that is. This is how it's impacted me. Because without that, you can never mm. work on real healing because you can't address the actual issue. Mm, mm. And do you think some of that is due to the idea that if I acknowledge it, things will fall apart? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. And as children, when we're developing that coping mechanism, <clears throat> if you think about being a child, we have no power, no control. We don't really even understand what's happening. Um, you know, even aside from trauma specifically, we just don't have, our brain isn't developed yet. So mm -hmm. our 
the context of what we're experiencing things just sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense. So denial serves a purpose. It's none of these coping mechanisms are about being weak or anything like that. In fact, the, our ability to develop these coping mechanisms is actually quite amazing because they serve mm. an incredible purpose. But as children, because there is no power, because we have no ability to really change circumstances, the denial keeps us, in a sense, disconnected from the reality of what that experience means. So it actually does serve a valuable purpose at the time that we're needing to use it. And do we, obviously it starts in, in childhood and it definitely plays on adulthood as well. And um, let's say for a person who's, let's just use addiction because it's easier to understand. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of denial behind, I might have a problem. Mm -hmm. And similar to that, it's like, if I admit that I have a problem, then I have to deal with my problem. <laughs> Then I have to deal with my problem, which is challenging. And sometimes, oftentimes, acknowledging this problem, whatever this problem might be, like even experiencing trauma and certainly addiction, there's so much shame that's often attached mm. to either one of those things. And so our defense, our self-protective part doesn't want to acknowledge it either. Mm, mm. With, with denial, is it the same thing as, say, for example, um, like denying ourselves help? Like if someone needs help, but they tell themselves that they don't need help. So they just kind of self denial. Is that? It is a, a thing form, as well, isn't it? <laughs> that absolutely is a thing. And some of the same mechanisms, I think, can be in play there. And part of that can be, well, there's nothing for me to like work on, or there's nothing I need to face, or there's nothing I need to deal with. But part of it also mm. is fear. And, and this is where shame can mm. play in sometimes too, is if I talk about it, then other people are going to know. If I talk about it, then I have to accept that reality. And denial serves as a way to not have to accept the reality because oftentimes, particularly if we're talking about childhood trauma or even facing an addiction, facing the reality is incredibly painful and overwhelming mm. much of the time. So it's mm. easier and safer. <laughs> And at least it feels safer to be in denial about it. Mm, so the, the longer you kind of, especially if there's an, an obvious issue that the outside might see, you just keep denying it. Eventually, I think it becomes harder. Like if you're doing something for months and years and the, like the light bulb just doesn't come on, like, you know, it's like you hold on to it. <laughs> You hold on to your story for so long, even if everything yeah. is telling you this different. Yes. Yeah. I, it's, it's interesting in my work quite often, I will work with people. Sometimes I've even been to therapy before and they can still be in denial, maybe not so much about their trauma. Like they can acknowledge that it happened, but where they tend to have difficulty is the significance of that trauma, like what it really means to be a trauma survivor. Mm. They can also really struggle with being able to fully acknowledge the grief that they might experience around mm. that, the grief and loss, and certainly shame. Shame can be a big thing that a lot of people can be in denial about. Now, there's, I want to be clear, there's nothing for anybody to be ashamed of, but Shame is a natural part of what I think a lot of us as humans tend to experience, but particularly for mm. childhood trauma mm -hmm. survivors, there's a ton of shame. And a lot of people are very much in denial about that because acknowledging the shame that we feel can be devastating because it's such a, such a hateful energy towards ourselves. 
mm. that it that we work mm. to do whatever we can to deny that. And I think addiction, that's a big thing in addiction as well. There's a lot of shame often attached to that. Mm, mm. Even even grief, I think denial is like the first stages of processing grief. Is mm-hmm. You kind of deny, like you might deny like a loss, for example. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I, think the, I think I saw a circle of like stages of grief and denial is definitely, it's probably the first two anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and it, an interesting thing about denial is it, it really can look a little bit different, right? Like with denial and grief, you might not be denying that somebody has passed away, but you might be denying that, that you're really devastated about it or that Mm. you miss that person, or maybe the nature of that relationship, maybe even denying that you don't really miss that person, but feel like you should really miss (laughs) that person. And then you feel this inner conflict without really being aware of the impact that it's having on you. Mm, mm. I might find a question on that one. We, in childhood, for example, so when a parent uh, say a child or something and a, and a parent asks them the question, so are they more denying what they did or are they lying what they did? You think that they didn't, because they're not a, they don't have a concept of lying, they just kind of go into denial. And as an no, adult, I might about... think that, like as an Sorry. adult, for example, I might think that like my child is lying to me when in fact they're in the denial mechanism. I think it depends on is that... if you're talking about like something a child's going to get in trouble for, like, did you break that lamp? Yeah. <laughs> and they say, no, Yeah, I would yeah. say that's lying. <laughs> I would say that that's lying. <laughs> no, that doesn't make that a bad kid or anything like that. Um, but that I would say is lying. Denial. So the thing about coping mechanisms is we're typically not aware that we're doing it. It okay. becomes an automatic response to something. So for example, in like a parenting sort of situation, if um, let's say your child is struggling at school for some reason, maybe, you know, there's a bully or something like that. And a parent is saying, you know, how was your day? And the kid might say, oh, it was fine. And they maybe talk about something other than the bullying that they experienced. Now that can be lying because they don't want their parent to go to the school or something like that. But Mm. Depending on other kinds of circumstances, potentially a child could be in denial about, no, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, You know, Mm. they didn't really mean it. And these actually fall into some other ways of coping as well. So there can be an aspect of denying the reality of that experience, but it's not coming from a conscious place. The child isn't saying, I'm going to choose to not be honest with my mom. But it's, Mm. I can't face, I can't talk about the fact that I'm being bullied. So therefore I'm going to deny it. But coping mechanisms generally Mm. are not things that we are choosing. Yes, yes, yes. You're reacting to a situation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My, yes. We move on to the next one, which is avoidance. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Sounds obvious, but how does <laughs> what does it mean and how does it look like so avoidance can look a lot of different ways so I'm, I, let me start with what it really kind of means avoidance is a way that we kind of defer or detour in a sense particular things or feelings or mm. ideas Um, so if somebody, for example, asks how you're doing when you come home from school and you change the subject, um, or you, you're in a group of people and there's a conversation that comes up and you find yourself just deciding to go to the bathroom or something like that. Again, it's not necessarily conscious decisions like, oh, I don't want to be a part of this conversation. It's too hard for me. 
I'm going to go do something else. Now, as we become adults, we might be a little bit more aware of that. But again, this develops very mm. early on because you're doing it as a self-protective experience. I can't have this conversation. I don't want to think about this. This makes me feel too uncomfortable. So what can I do to avoid being in that conversation? What can I do to avoid feeling that feeling? Avoidance is where mm. addiction <laughs> comes in, where humor, a lot of people use humor as a way to avoid feeling certain things. Um, mm. <laughs> so avoidance can look a lot of different ways. Having that glass of wine when you come home from a stressful day or that beer, um, that can be a form of avoidance because maybe, you know, you're, you're feeling stress and instead of being intentional and kind of connecting within, you go to something that just kind of helps you escape in a sense. Mm. So avoidance and escapism mm. kind of can go all along together there a little bit, but it can also be things like, um, okay, well, I know I need to, for example, like, okay, I know I should journal right now. Somebody might say, you know, like, okay, I know journaling would probably help me right now, but I just mm. have too many other things to do. Right. So instead of doing that thing, because it might feel a little uncomfortable, it might bring up some things that they don't want to deal with. They go and do those other things instead, but they're not thinking, oh, I want to avoid doing this. They're like that discomfort kind of comes up and suddenly, oh, wait, I need to do this. I'll do this after I'm done with that. But then mm, you don't end up mm. coming back to it. No, no, you never do. No. <laughs> Two days later, like, yeah, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So in, in, say, a group situation, say I'm out and my friend is talking about something, and I might feel uncomfortable and just do something without actually knowing that it's not like I'm avoiding the conversation. It's just something within me feels uncomfortable. So I'm just going to go to bar, for example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is, and if you are conscious of it, it can still be a coping mechanism for sure. Um, but where it tends to be problematic is when you're not aware that you're doing it. Now, I would actually say okay. like if you are out with friends and there's a conversation that you know you just don't want to be a part of, it just feels uncomfortable, you know it's going to be triggering to you, um, you just know that it's a topic that makes you not feel very good or something like that. Making the choice to go like I'm, I'm going to remove myself from this so that I don't end up feeling that, that can still be avoidance. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily something that you need to change. Does that make sense? Mm. Now, depending on the circumstance, mm. it might be something to work on changing because maybe you end up not being a part of important conversations, like making choices <laughs> about what you're mm. going to be doing or you know, <laughs> something like that. So there may be something there that might be important to work on. But I also think that there are times that removing yourself when there's something that you know is going to be difficult for you can actually be a healthy choice. The difference is that you're yeah. consciously choosing that thing. Mm, mm. So with some conscious awareness, it's like you're opting out like, okay, I'm actually going to get out now. If you're yeah. not really aware of it, you're just responding. Yeah. Without knowing that you're actually doing it. <laughs> right. And that that is where the, the problem, kind of the problematic patterns arise is when we're doing these things without really any awareness that we're doing them. Because it from that place, it often ends up creating an aspect of difficulty in our lives. Mm -hmm. And like with this, like other people can see it. <laughs> like if I'm avoiding a situation. <laughs> Other people can see it and they'll say you're avoiding it, but I'm going to be like, no, I'm not. <laughs> a lot of times people can, absolutely. And kind of as a little bit of a side note here, because this isn't specifically about coping mechanisms, but mm -hmm. what can happen quite often. So somebody might be avoiding unconsciously. 
This happens a lot in relationships. Somebody might be avoiding something unconsciously and the other person experiences that as disinterest, not caring, um, not, mm, not yeah. recognizing, you know, what's happening for this person in that moment. And it doesn't make one person right or wrong, but that person, like if they want to have a conversation about their relationship, for example, so let's talk about a partnership, a romantic relationship. Mm. One person wants to have a conversation about their relationship, but the other person feels worried that that person's going to, you know, criticize them. They might avoid it. Like, oh no, I can't right now. I need to go to do this. Well, this mm. person is going to feel like I'm trying to talk to you about our relationship and you don't even care. So that is one mm. of the biggest reasons <laughs> that recognizing our coping mechanisms and how they show up in our lives is incredibly important because it does, it can have an impact on the relationships yeah. that we have in our lives. Totally, yeah, totally. And then if you're avoiding this subject and then the other, your partner is thinking all sorts of things, it's like, oh, you don't, you don't care about us anymore. And it's like, mm -hmm. I do, but I'm just really trying to avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's a huge yeah. thing in relationships. Mm, mm, mm. Brilliant. We move on to the next one, which is minimization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> minimization. So <laughs> how does that look like? So minimizing, particularly again with any trauma, really, but particularly childhood trauma, minimizing mm. looks like it's, it's what we're saying to ourselves. We will often say it to other people as well, but it's the biggest impact is that we are minimizing to ourselves um, initially. And so that can look like it's not that bad. It only happened once. Mm. Um, or it was only one person, or at least I was eight and not three. Um, at mm. least I wasn't hit. Uh, lots of different mm. ways, but we're basically taking our experience and making it smaller, making it seem like it's mm. not that big of a deal. And while it serves a purpose and a very important purpose at the time, because if mm. we actually allowed ourselves to take in the reality of the significance of what this means, particularly when it's something that you're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis, like something happening in your home um, mm. or regularly in your extended family or something like that, if we had to take in the reality of that experience or those experiences and what it means, quite literally, we, none of us who experience childhood trauma mm. would be able to come out of childhood intact, like emotionally and physically intact, because it would be too, too much. Like people talk about like a psychotic mm. break or something like that. If we had to take in the reality of those experiences, and this can be true too for if there's a lot of um, like violence in your community, that can also be a similar type of situation because again, you have no control and you're faced with pain and potentially life-threatening. And again, as a child, your brain is, isn't developed. You can't discern mm. the difference between actually potentially losing your life or losing the love or trust of this person that you care about. Um, mm. So we need to be able to do that. It serves a really important purpose. The problem is that when we do that, and this can actually happen too, like if you have a parent that maybe has an addiction or has depression or isn't around mm. a lot, um, 
children can minimize the impact of that. Like, well, it's not that big of a deal or, well, I know that they love me, so it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that even in those situations, it does matter. It has a profound impact. So as we go through our lives, because we have minimized this, we believe that it's not a big deal that it really hasn't or shouldn't have an impact on us, that 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 has no bearing on our experience in our lives. But it does, and it shows up in lots of different ways. And instead mm. of being able to create the connection and understand that and then do, to work, do the work to heal it, we end up believing that we're bad, we're weak, we're undeserving. Why am I struggling like this? Because it was such a long time ago and it wasn't that big of a deal. Mm. I cannot tell you how many people, how many versions of minimizing <laughs> I have heard over the years. And a lot of them are very similar. Um, but for example, one thing that I hear so often from people that experienced interpersonal childhood trauma is, well, it, but it wasn't my father. It wasn't my mm. mother. And mm. somehow that means that it's not that big of a deal because they look at other people that have experienced abuse by a mother or father. And well, that's really bad. But what I experienced isn't. And it is as bad. In many ways, it is completely just as bad. Mm -hmm. But when you mm. believe that, well, it's not that bad, and look at this person who was abused by their father and look how well they're doing, what is wrong with me? that I'm struggling like this because of this, or it, you know, it was one time or it wasn't, you know, it was when I was five to 15, it wasn't from two to 17, mm. right? Like people will mm. find a way to minimize their experience because it's how we are able to believe that it's not really that bad so that we can cope mm. day to day and show up as if everything is okay. And do you think for children, partly the reason why we do it, well, yeah, many of us do it, they do it, <laughs> mm -hmm. is because it allows us to have that attachment still. Because yeah. if I really to, to see, for example, I'm just saying, if I was to really see my father for, for example, the abused person that he was, I would dis uh, I would dis myself from him when I actually need him. So I need to kind of say, oh, he only hit me once. At least then it's okay and I can still have the attachment with him just to kind yes. of survive childhood. <laughs> Without a doubt, mm. absolutely. And I would say that denial plays into that as well. Denial can be a big reason why we do mm. that. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And it can also play into... Um, another coping mechanism that we'll talk about as well. But without a <laughs> doubt, what I was talking about, like our self-protective part um, and our, our ability to go on as if everything is okay, we need to be able to do exactly what you just mentioned. We can't accept the reality that this person that we have to rely on, that we love, that is saying mm. that they love us, um, that is supposed to protect us. We cannot accept that that person is the one hurting us. Like we don't have the mm. developmental capacity to kind of wrap our heads around to hold both of those things at the same time. We literally do not have the developmental capacity to do that. Mm. Mm. And when you kind of in that environment as well as a child, when you become an adult and you get into relationship, when similar thing is happening, you're just going to still minimize it, be like, oh, he's not really that bad, or she's not really that bad. Even yeah. when they are, because you, like, obviously, you say it's, it's a romantic relationship, you're like, okay, I need my partner, so I just minimize <laughs> yes. the, the say bad things that they're doing. So at least that way, I'm still in a relationship, even though in reality, it is bad. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that is an important thing to recognize too with all of these coping mechanisms. And that's a, a great example of this, that the coping mechanisms we develop early in our lives 
they continue <laughs> throughout our lives. Mm. <laughs> so we find ourselves often doing, you know, saying the same kinds of things to ourselves in similar types of situations because that's what feels real. That's what mm. we believe to be real. And so we continue those patterns throughout until we're able mm. to <laughs> do the work to heal it. Mm. Mm, until something happens, <laughs> like <laughs> even at that, and then denial comes along because you have to fight it first. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And the last one that I have is rationaliza rationalization. Yes. And how so, does that one look like? <laughs> so rationalization um, looks like the example that you just gave about um, like with a father, for example, and I don't remember exactly what you said now, but we make, <laughs> basically it's kind of like making an excuse for, right? So, yes. well, they didn't really mean it. Um, mm. they just had a bad day. They're lonely. Um, they are just really stressed out. Um, they don't know better. It happened. This is a mm. big one. Well, it happened to them too. Mm. Mm. That's yeah. a huge You're almost one. making excuse. <laughs> yeah, and You're that's really kind of what for... it is. Yeah. And that basically is what rationalization is, is it's excusing, mm. it's ultimately excusing the behavior, the significance of the behavior. It doesn't matter. Like we're telling ourselves, it doesn't matter because they were drunk, they were tired, they were stressed, they are having a hard time while well, they were abused too. Mm, I mean, it's, mm. it really is about excusing because again, what you were saying just a moment ago, if we can find a reason that the person is doing it, then it's not about us. If there's a reason yeah. that they're doing it, then it doesn't mean that that's how they feel about us. Mm. Right. So mm. that helps us be in that environment. It helps us be around that person over and over again. It helps us hold on to an idea that this person loves and, and protects us. Even mm. if that person isn't a parent, mm. that could be true. Like if it's a sibling or um, a cousin, and it doesn't have to be abuse specifically, it could be like bullying type of behavior or teasing even, or something like that. But we, we take responsibility away from that person because if it's the person choosing to do something to us, then how must they feel about me? And what does that say about me? But if it's because they were abused or because they're really stressed out, then it's not their fault and it's not my fault. Mm. Mm. Which is like interesting because we still blame ourselves. No matter what, we still ultimately <laughs> blame ourselves. So you, you're almost playing down uh, another person's behavior. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, like you didn't really mean to do that to you. Yes, exactly. Even though, now obviously, I like to think that he didn't mean to do it, but you're still not really acknowledging their behavior because you're kind of like, oh, they didn't really mean to do it, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It w like it was yeah. an accident or it was just a one-time, you know, thing or he doesn't he or she doesn't have a lot of support and so they don't have anybody you know that they can talk to about it so it comes out in this way and the, the mm. things that we can come up with to rationalize somebody's behavior it's pretty interesting how imaginative mm. we can be <laughs> as children particularly but i guess we all know that children are very imaginative right um in, yeah. in lots of really good, healthy ways. <laughs> and <laughs> in a sense, that is actually a healthy, it doesn't serve us in the long term, but at the time, again, it serves a really valuable purpose, particularly like if you're being abused at home, whatever mm. type of abuse that might be, emotional, physical, sexual, um, if we can make ourselves believe 
that, you know, if you're, if your mom is beating you, if you can make yourself believe that your mom is doing that because of something else that has nothing to do with her or you, then it's easier to fee- try to make yourself feel like you're safe, which you're not, but that's what we mm-hmm. do in part to try to feel safe so that we can go on every single day. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Great, great. They are, like the four that we discussed, um, some of them kind of interchange like within each other. Like you could be using two or three of them same in the same event, <laughs> like as the yes. adult, not so much the child, but like as an adult. Um, Even as a child, I, can, like, I think sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but certainly as an adult. It's a lot of brain power. A lot of brain power. <laughs> It is. It's quite, we're quite amazing creatures, really. Yeah. Um, like, I can rationalize someone treating me bad and also deny their behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and in a yeah. sense, you are denying their behavior by the rationalization that you're coming up mm. with. Mm. Mm. Definitely. So how, how does one, how do I start Right, is the big thing to kind of get out of this is having the awareness of when I'm actually doing it. Awareness of the ways that you tend to cope with things is the most important step. Because again, most of us are not very conscious of it. Now, I think over the last handful mm. of years or so, there uh, people are becoming more aware of things just with so much internet <laughs> stuff and social media and all of that. Mm. Um, but when we bring it into awareness, when we recognize how we tend to cope, then we can be aware when it's happening. We can also then work to understand, okay, why why do I cope in this way? And be very intentional about learning new ways of coping and hopefully um, mm. <laughs> doing the work to heal what those coping mechanisms were needed for because a huge source of shame for a lot of people in adulthood is mm. recognizing like let's let, let's use alcohol for an example even if you're not technically like an alcoholic but let's say you every night you have to have a drink when you come home which some people would argue <laughs> makes you an alcoholic um, <laughs> yeah but but like you might have a lot of shame around that And if you just try to stop it, you're not going to stop it because that's your way of coping. And you're going to continue to need to cope if you haven't worked on healing the thing that drove you to that in the first place. (laughs) So it creates a lot of shame. Like, why can't I stop this? Well, you can't stop it because a coping mechanism, like I was saying, it's unconscious. It's very much the same is if you think about how if something is flying towards your head naturally instinctively you're going to duck right you're you're going to close your eyes and you're going to duck you don't have to think about it it just automatically mm. happens right well our coping mechanisms yeah. that we develop early in life are exactly the same they happen automatically we don't have to think about it we just do it. We act just like, you know, that quickly. Mm. And if we are doing something and, you know, part of that could be um, that as part of our avoidance, we project things onto other people. And so maybe we get angry at somebody else. Mm. Well, Oftentimes, if that's what happens, you might feel bad about that afterward. You had difficulty acknowledging that. Yeah. <laughs> you might feel shame. You may not recognize that you feel shame. In fact, a lot of times when people feel shame, it can express itself and feel like anger at the person that made you feel that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then Major, you feel yeah. bad. <laughs> but then you feel bad. And you don't really know why. So if you don't really know why, you can never address 
the thing, which means you cannot change the thing. You're just going to keep doing the same thing that you've always done because it's instinctive at that point. And then you keep feeling bad mm. about it. So coping mechanisms take a lot of intentional effort to mm. shift. Awareness is the first most important step, but it takes <laughs> yeah. a lot of practice to actually use different coping mechanisms because our instinct is to go to what we've always done. And again, avoidance can look a lot of different ways. Avoidance can look like sitting in front of the TV for, you know, binging on two seasons of something. <laughs> avoidance can look like getting drunk. It can look like going out and having indiscriminate sex, gambling. It can shopping, sleeping, you know, 16 hours a day. Like it can really look mm -hmm. a lot of different ways. Being surrounded by people all the time where you're the life of the party, right? Mm. So it can really look a lot of different ways and they don't all have to look bad. They can look like you're doing, you know, really well. And that can be a way that we can be in denial about the fact that we're struggling. But mm. we're going to continue to do the things that we've always done until we're able to become aware and practice new ways of coping. And practicing new ways of coping takes a lot of intentional <laughs> effort. And it takes practice over time, sometimes quite a bit of time, before those coping mechanisms are replaced. Like if you think about how long, how much practice would it take for you to be able to sit there as something's flying towards your face without moving? Now, let's say you recognize that that thing flying to your face, okay, it's actually going to veer off right before it hits you. <laughs> but how long is it actually going to take your body to not automatically yeah. respond to that? Coping mechanisms are the same. So when we try to change them, it's important to really recognize that it's not simple. You don't just tell yourself, oh, I'm doing this and I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to do this instead. Like instead of avoiding, I'm going to journal. Well, that's a nice thought and it can be helpful, but it's not going to be natural. You're going to have to make yourself do it. And it's going to take a lot of practice before that even registers mm. as an option for coping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of this, the, the ones that we've discussed in a way, it's unconscious and it's developed in childhood. So when, when I reach 30 or 40, and I've always rationalized everything around my life. It's going to be very difficult for me to just kind of like, I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's impossible. Cause you don't, cause there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotions involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Because there's a lot of emotion involved. It's not just in your head. <laughs> Absolutely. And because it is such an ingrained thing. It's, you know, people talk a lot about the reptilian brain and that's where our like breathing comes from. Like it's automatic responses, like ducking mm. when something is coming toward your head. Our coping mechanisms that we develop early in life are actually very much the same. We're not thinking about it. It's an automatic thing. And so it's really important because people can feel like if I was just strong enough, I'd be able to do this. What's wrong mm. with me? Why can't I do this? It's not about strength. It's not about determination. It's about awareness and continued practice over time. Those things have to be mm. there in order for any of that to actually change. It's why even like if you think about habits, changing habits, right? Because yeah. it becomes just yeah. kind of this automatic thing, not to the same degree that a coping mechanism does, but it's just this automatic thing. And changing a habit is not easy. Changing an ingrained automatic behavior is absolutely not easy and takes a lot <laughs> for that to actually change. It really does. Mm, and then is. for that to for that to become yeah, the thing that you go to. So like if you are struggling with something for, um, you know, taking some deep breaths or going for a walk, that's not going to even like literally, it's not even going to be a thought that comes to mind when you're in that moment because you're activated. Mm. 
When there's a thing that you need to cope with, your body is activated. So it's going to go to the thing that has been patterned into your nervous system. It's going to go into that pattern. In order to have a thought about doing something else, we have to have the practice of creating enough space from the activation and the behavior to a new behavior. So we have to be able to recognize this activation and then make a having the awareness to make a different choice because those coping mechanisms are not choices. Mm, mm. So once you, sorry, <laughs> I can keep, I can keep asking you questions about this. <laughs> no problem. Um, so once you're activated, for example, by that time it's too late because the yes. emotion's already up. It, so particularly in the beginning, like especially in the, yeah. and I would say sometimes at least a year, depending on your history, maybe even longer than a year. Mm. So by the time I'm activated, I'm already in that moment. I'm already denying something or I'm in, avoiding something. So with the awareness, it's being about noticing before I'm activated and then yes. having that space to choose. Yes. What to do next. And yes, I'll yes to all of that. And another important part <laughs> of that is that, so before you get from that awareness and being able to choose something different, the practice is, while you aren't necessarily going to be able to change it in the moment when you're activated, during the practice and the processing part, you can recognize afterward, like, oh, that's what happened. And mm. in that moment, you can say, okay, how did that happen? Like, or why did that happen? And then think, okay, what else might I have been able to do in that moment? So like actually reflecting on it and being able to think, okay, what else might I have done in that moment? So having almost like a plan in place, like what are some things that I can do? And even though you can't do it in that moment, you can do it once you bring that awareness to it. So you can practice that thing. Maybe it's journaling, maybe it's breathing, maybe it's going for a walk, maybe it's calling somebody, you know, it could be any number of things, but then you can, particularly if you're still feeling some of the feelings around it, you can do that mm. thing. And the practice is where healing happens. Healing isn't just here. <laughs> healing <laughs> happens throughout all of this in the middle. And part mm. of that practice is what can I do next time? Or what can I try to practice doing? Being intentional about that, like thinking of different ideas and possibilities. Anytime that you're feeling something that's kind of difficult or that you're struggling with, begin practicing some of those other ways of coping. And then the more you practice that, eventually there will be more space in between mm. the event, you'll have an awareness a little bit more quickly, even if your initial reaction is to rationalize or whatever, mm -hmm. you'll recognize you're doing it, and then you can work to do something different. And over mm. time, eventually, generally speaking, eventually your automatic response will be to do one of those other things. So for example, one of the things that I've noticed for myself is um, particularly in the past, I would hold my breath a lot and like just an anxious sort of response. I would hold my breath a lot or I would breathe very shallowly. And this has been going on for quite a few years at this point, <laughs> but there are times even now, like if I notice that my body is feeling kind of stressed, what I will notice, I don't necessarily notice any particular thing going on, but I will notice that I take a deep breath and sigh. And my husband will some, I don't even notice it really anymore, but my husband will say <laughs> something wrong. And, and I'm like, no. And I'll realize like, okay, yeah, I just took that really deep breath. And that doesn't have to mean that there's something bad happening. It's just maybe I haven't been breathing fully. Maybe I am a little, you know, kind of stressed or, you know, like trying to focus on too many things at one time. So that mm. has become my automatic way now of mm. managing some stress happening mm. in my body. Yeah. Yeah. 
and with with the practice, sorry, when you explain things, then I get another question. That's great. <laughs> with the practice, <laughs> with the practice, for example, say I'm in in denial, and something happens, and I deny it, and then let's just say two hours later, I realize, or oh, I'm after doing that again. So that's the practice, and then one day it would be an hour, one day it would be half an hour. I think yeah. the more I practice, the kind of closer I get to. Yeah. I get closer to the actual activation. Like uh, that, yes, the time exactly. gap gets closer and smaller and smaller. The more I practice doing it. Yes. Okay. And and part of the practice is so it's bringing awareness to that, and then part of the practice would be when you recognize that there that that denial has happened then you are also you also need to be intentional about moving away from denial about that thing so whatever that thing was that you went into denial about recognizing mm -hmm. okay wait a second no that actually did happen or i really did feel that way about it like so being able to not just recognize the denial but then letting yourself no longer be <laughs> no longer be in denial <laughs> yeah, about that yeah. thing yeah yes yes Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. I love I, talking about all I, of this. I, I love keep the questions. Asking you questions. <laughs> I love um, the questions. I could keep going on about this because I just don't, I just find it fascinating because we like we all just respond to things and, mm -hmm. and we just respond to things and just say like that's just who I am. And but we don't know like habits, you know many of us think that when you're trying to change a habit, for example, you're going to keep changing your behavior, but you don't know what's causing you to behave a certain way. Yeah. And it's almost like until you know what's causing you to do X, Y, and Z, you're going to keep behaving a certain way. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about de defenses like this, like these are even more difficult because it carries emotions and yep. uncomfortable feelings and, one thing we learn in childhood is don't go to those feelings, <laughs> suppress them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And that yeah. does play a huge role, <laughs> yeah. you know, even without any sort of trauma or anything that by itself really does, because you have to learn to cope with that, right? Like if you're told not to cry, then, okay, well then maybe it's not that big of a deal. So even in something like that, mm. right. Um, or, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Or, oh, don't feel so sad about it. Or, you know, yeah. or, you know, like you have a pet die and well, they're in a better place now. Well, mm. that doesn't make me feel any better. Like, wait a minute, but I still feel sad. Am I not supposed to feel sad because they're in a better place? Like it, there's a lot of things that we experience, even under pretty good circumstances that, yeah. that impact a child's way of thinking and feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Which is part of the reason that That's I say it. that everybody is wounded. We cannot escape childhood All without right. some sort of wounding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And the ones that don't have any wounding, they're the ones that definitely have wounding. <laughs> yes, people that are in denial yeah. about their wounding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, my childhood was great. But they yep. don't really have a lot of memories about childhood. It's like, yeah, that's why. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love conversations about childhood. It's a fascinating time of life. <laughs> and very impactful no, time of life with. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can sort of understand why people uh, avoid this type of work. Uh, not so much avoid it, but just like, because you, when you spend 20, 30, 40 years running away from your feelings, like, someone tells you you have to face them. It's like, what is this? You yeah. know, and because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where you're opening the door to. Yeah. And once you start, it's very difficult to kind of close it because you're kind of like, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges to kind of collectively our mental health, because so many of the like mental health, mental health issues have not gotten worse over the years. I don't, I don't believe, um, people are just more talking about it a little bit more. People are more aware of it now. Um, but allowing ourselves to face whatever those difficulties are that created what we believe about who we mm. are and our coping mechanisms, it's not 
easy to do. And our society no. actually tells you that not to, right? Like, well, it was in the past yeah, or you just need to move on or just forgive. And, you know, like, like there's a weakness in facing the past or like, oh, you just want to blame everything on your childhood. And the reality mm. is our child is childhood is a thing, generally speaking, even without trauma that influences us most as adults. Because everything mm. about who we believe we are and the world develops as children. <laughs> yeah. So we take that with us into adulthood. <laughs> and so yeah, often I we're do. unaware of what we're bringing into adulthood. Yeah, yeah. And people like advice like, oh, just move on. It wasn't a big deal. Like <laughs> intellectually that sounds okay, but it's, it's not. <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> it's helpful. probably worth advice. No, it's worth advice to give someone. Um, I think so. I have two more questions, which is not related to this. Okay. So my first one is, what do you do for fun? Ooh, um, I love to be outside when the weather is nice. It is a little hot where I live in Arizona. So during the summer, we don't really go oh, out nice. much, but this is actually a beautiful time of year. So I love just being outside and taking in, Arizona is a beautiful or state. I was going to say country. <laughs> um <laughs> Arizona is a beautiful state, and I love just kind of taking that in. I also like reading fiction, um, which is new to me. Just in the last handful of years or so, I've started reading fiction. So I like to do that on my downtime as I'm just kind of enjoying peace and quiet. Mm, beautiful. And my last question is, if you were to attend therapy, what would your ideal therapist be like? Great question. I have attended therapy many times. I think every therapist should have their own therapist at least <laughs> once in their life, um, if not multiple times. And I have been to therapy many times in my life. But that's a great question. Um, I don't. I've had some not so great therapists over the years. I think um, one who is willing to talk about things that a lot of therapists aren't willing to talk about, um, who are willing to sit with their own discomfort as mm. people talk about things, um, because I'm very open and I will talk about anything and everything um, that, that is actually interested and so will ask questions. Um, I'm mm. not, I'm personally not one of those therapists. Well, I'm not a therapist technically any longer. I've never been one of those therapists just that just doesn't say anything. I ask a lot of questions because I think there's a lot to learn about people. There's a lot that drives our behavior. And mm. so a therapist that is willing to engage in the therapy with me, I think is important. And who's mm. done their own therapy. That's probably the most important <laughs> <Yeah>. thing. <laughs> yes. Probably the most important if, thing. Yeah. If they can't sit with their own discomfort, then you're in the wrong office. Absolutely. Especially when it, it's trauma related. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Ask the Therapist. No, 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 expert, expert, because you're no longer a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you weren't, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thank you for joining us today for another episode of Ask the Expert. Today I'm joined, we joined by, oh, sorry, start again. After this part, I'm, I'm calm and I'm good. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a quick review on my Facebook page, Don't Be Afraid to Talk, or DM me on Instagram. The show notes will include all of the relevant links from today's episode. If you haven't already, please download, leave a rating, and share with your friends. You might just reach that person who needs to hear this message. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. I am James Lumumba, signing off with gratitude.